Hello and welcome to the Hurland Show. Sorry about the late throw in here. We're normally here at one o'clock, but uh, we've been pushed back by the World Cup Daily Show. Obviously, as a hurling man, that's not good enough for me. But here we are anyway. We have a packed show coming up, whether you're getting us on YouTube, Facebook, Periscope, whatever it is. And we're brought to you in association with Boyle Sports. And for special offers, head to offtheball.com forward slash Boyle Sports. So we have some great videos coming up with Dara Fitzgibbon of Cork. Monster Hurling Final is on this weekend. Monster Clare. The Leinster Hurling Final is on as well. We've also got Rory O'Connor of Wexford talking about who he thinks is actually, you know, the, compar uh, the comparisons between Galway and Kilkenny. We've also got Joe Quaid as well. We're going to talk about the Ferrari with the Antrim and Kildare hurlers who are forced to be playing a week after the Christie Ring Cup final. In the studio, we have Dave McIntyre. How are you doing, Dave? Thanks for having me back. Delighted to have you. Uh, my focus has kind of returned to football over the last two or three weeks, but... Um, this is the hurling championship second wind starting this weekend. You're going to get stuck in. You won't be windy anyway. I won't. I'm, I'm expecting a massive battle over the next hour. That is the major consideration when you're a hurler. I was just telling Colin. We've Colin Ryan here from Clare, 2013 All Ireland winner. Are you well? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, cheers. Um, yeah, I suppose tip her out now. I suppose so. It's nice to have a Clare man up. <laughs> you there, yeah. didn't wait long, did you? I couldn't. You didn't wait I long, couldn't. but I you couldn't. couldn't build on that All Ireland in 2013. It was a fluke. Ah. <laughs> There's no fluky All Irelands. You take them no, all. No, certainly not. <laughs> When's the last not. All Ireland title tip built on? Look, we're not here to talk about that. <laughs> Thanks, they won their All Ireland, but they went on to win three or four monsters after. They were in All Ireland finals. Uh, you know, sure. Limerick, you wouldn't don't, Lim Limerick don't even want monsters now. All right, <laughs> you're happy to throw the boot into Limerick a week after beating them in the championship. But anyway, as the mother said to me, she doesn't care if you're good or bad at hurling as long as you're not windy, and that's the main thing here today. Anyway, we'll start off, Colin. You're you're still only 29 years of age. Is that right? Yeah. And yeah. it's a year, you, you retired from hurling a year ago as well, on the inter-county stage as well. Are you missing it? Yeah, I was going to say, I didn't retire from hurling, like, I just yeah, retired yeah. from inter-county. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you would, you'd miss, like, I suppose, uh, you know, Clare and Limerick in Cusey Park, a packed house, like, you'd miss things like that, and you miss, you know, the Munster final this weekend or something, but, like, everything that goes before that, you know, you don't miss it, like, you know, <laughs> having to prepare and sacrifice from November and December when I got the call off Donald, you know, wondering would I come back. I think I said it to, to Louise at home like that in February, like I had to said, I'd pull my hair out if I had to go back, like, you know, from listening to stories of meetings and training and, you know, everything that went with it. So, like, obviously, you know, it's, it's what you play for is, is week like this, but, like, there's so much more that goes with it. Yeah, and a huge amount of your career would have been defined by clashes against Cork, that All-Ireland final, of course, in 2013, and the replay as well. Thrilling games as well. Like, the, you must be kind of half-chomping at the bit, thinking, I could be involved this weekend. Oh, yeah, of course, like, and especially the last couple of years when they've kind of got the better of us again, like, you know, and not having something to, you know, not being able to, to control that, I suppose, is a big thing, but, um, you know, I think the feeling around Clare is, is good going into Sunday, like, so... You know, hopefully we can turn the tide a small bit again and, and get the bragging rights back. Mm. I noticed at the time when you did announce your retirement, you went on Twitter to do it. I thought it was a very interesting picture that you put up as well. I think we have it there at the moment. Look at that. Explain that to us now. That's as lovey-dovey as it gets. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of, like, I suppose, I was looking for something that would deflect from me maybe more than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> What's the, better than a child? <laughs> yeah, the doting daddy, the doting yeah, daddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, think. it was nice, I suppose. Louise, uh, we got a couple of pictures taken there at the start and he got his first clear jersey. So uh, I, th I think it still fits him, actually. I think. He's probably the same size as half the clear forwards, oh, is he? No, yeah. <laughs> So tell us about uh, the free taking because that was something that you were exceptional at. In 2013, it felt like you barely missed. And I remember Limerick had awful trouble with the freeze in the semi final, and you you were just knocking them over from all angles. Did you ever feel pressure? Um, I'd be honest, uh, like no. When I got onto the field, even um, with 82,000 people looking at you, you don't know there's 82,000 people when you're on the field. Like you don't. That's not your thought process. But um, how do you avoid it? Because you're in a whole stadium where absolutely everyone there is focused on you and what you're about to it's do. It's weird, it's hard to describe it, like I think um, it's something that you know myself and Paul Knurk would have spent loads of time on, like you know, um, outside in LIT we spent so much time on it, we were kind of going through every type of scenario, you know, he'd be roaring at me and you know, roaring abuse at me and you know, I suppose one of the big things is we, we made sure we went out in every type of weather condition, I remember being out there one day and it was I, I don't think you just sent a dog out in it, like, you know, but <laughs> it, it just prepared because, like, you know, all Ireland finals don't stop for the weather, so... Um, you had a very specific routine, though, as well. That didn't change, I mean, and that's, I'm sure that's something yourself and Paul would have worked on as well. Yeah, yeah, that, that was, I suppose, that was the trigger, really. It's like a you comfort know. blanket, almost, is it? Yeah, yeah, and, like, <coughs> and that kind of, you know, if your thought process is on them things, then you don't think about the 82,000 people that are there, you know, it's kind of like, it's weird, you, it's very hard to describe as a player, but the adrenaline gets going and suddenly it's, I was, I, I suppose I was lucky, I was able to kind of split the Colin Ryan as a player and the Colin Ryan as a free taker. 
And, you know, I, I kind of felt nearly it was my job. When there was a free given, it was, you know, I just got into the zone and, you know, that was my thing and, you know, that was something that I suppose I was proud of and that, you know, the players were kind of proud of, you know, maybe they, they, they were confident that, you know, I was going to step up and do that. But certainly, you know, I think when you score the first one too, I think you kind of settled into it and, you know, I think that day against Limerick, I think the first one was a sharp read to Pat Donlan that couldn't, I, I think if I hit it a hundred times over, I don't think it could have hit it his hand as quick and, you know, it went over and suddenly, you know, you're into the game and, you know, the flow starts and stuff like that. I, you know, it's weird, going back to that, I actually felt extremely sorry for Declan Hannon that day, you know, and, fine, yeah. yeah, like it's, it's probably the loneliest place in the world, you know, I remember sending him a text um, the week after it, just saying, listen, we've all been there, like, you know, it's, I think there's a, a free takers probably, uh, you know, a morgue somewhere, you know, where we'll all meet at some stage. But, um, you know, it's definitely a lonely place, you know. When, you when find, th if you have a good start or if you're going well from the freeze, that it, it does help your, your, the rest of your game and what you're contributing to the team from play. And if you have a dodgy start and miss a couple, then suddenly you're, you, you almost want to hide and you wonder where the next freeze is coming from and your game from open play then is, is affected. Uh, when I started, it certainly did. Um, you know, it definitely, you know, I, could, I couldn't really, you know, get the two of them out of my head, you know, that it was like, you miss a free, you're suddenly a crap player, like, you know, it was, it, it, you know, but I think as, as time went on, I suppose, as I got a bit more mature and, you know, I, I suppose I'd practiced so much free taking mm. and stuff like that and I'd become confident uh, as a player that I was able to, you know, split the two of them and, you know, it didn't necessarily bother me as much then, you know. And as, as well with the... Um Actually, I wanted to ask you, who, what free takers at the moment do you rate? Because it likes Peter Duggan, who has only missed one free in the last two games for Clare, and that came off the post. Yeah, I've seen Peter, you know, at club level last year. I kind of, I, I, th I think I said something on Twitter in the first game this year that kind of got taken out of context. Um, you know, I think the, Peter missed two frees and. They've really suddenly hit a free from 21 yards out, and you know, I kind of said on Twitter, like you know, if Clare are going to win, they're going to need to, you know, have confidence in somebody like him, you know. And uh, I think, you know, that, that is probably told, you know, in the last five games, I've seen him at club level. You know, I don't think he ever missed a free against the market, you know, at club level. So, you know, I've seen him being able to step up, and he seems to, to just have that confidence at the minute, you know, off a good run club level last year and. You certainly need it. Every every county team needs somebody that they have confidence in that they're stepping over it, going, yeah, you know, this fella's going to score it, and you know, it make, makes a massive difference. But, you know, when you look at it, who's out there, you know, every county has somebody that's, mm. you know, is, is you know, Pat Horgan, T.J. Reid, you know, Joe Kenning, uh, Peter, obviously with Clare, you know, at the minute, I suppose every top county is going to need one. Yeah, and like you play, you play soccer as well. You won an Oscar trainer last year with Clare. It was, what, what was the full name title of the team? Was it Clare and District Region or something like that? Yeah, just Clare Soccer League. Yeah, yeah Clare, Clare Soccer League. League. Yeah. Uh, would you take the free kicks in the soccer as oh, well? Oh no, no, different no? style altogether. Different style altogether. And what was it like to to win that? I mean, I think I spoke to you last year, and you said it was quite different winning something in front of eighty thousand people versus five hundred people. Oh, of course it is. Like, yeah, you know, we went up to Bondor and we played uh, the Donegal. In a show, uh, yeah, in a show, yeah. And um, like you're going up preparation, you know, as low key as, as you can possibly get. Like, yeah. you know, I suppose the phone is hopping before not Ireland and hopping after it. Like, I think, you know, the only text I got off was mum and dad, like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> just saying best of luck. Like, and, you know, you're heading up there and you're heading to a stadium that, like, you know, I suppose, you know, you go, you, we got togged out in prefabs, like, you know, so yeah. like it's, it's completely different. But, you know, at the same time, I suppose all Ireland's in all Ireland and I'm, sport, I'm sure I look back at it with fond memories, you know. Uh, that competitive nature comes out in me and mm. you know you kind of want to win something. So you are a double All-Ireland winner, you didn't just do it once with Clare, you've nah, you done no. it twice. Yeah. So we, we, we mentioned... Times, under 21. Under 21 as well. Yeah. So he has one more than you. Yeah. Well, this isn't about me, Dave. <laughs> you know I like to make things about me, but for once it isn't. Um, I wanted to ask you about, well, we talk about free-taking. Wexford are one of the teams who have struggled. Their manager is Davy Fitz, who of course was your manager for a long time. What was your relationship like with Davy? Yeah, I, you know, um, I suppose love him or, or you know, load him. Um, uh, I had a really, really good relationship with Davy. Like um, I, you were asking, there was there ever a falling out? Um, uh, not necessarily. I'd say you were out. at fault if there was. By yeah, the way, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Record there. Um, but uh, not necessarily to be a falling out. There was often a disagreement, but I think we had that relationship where you know he'd ring me looking for my opinion. You know, he'd ring me telling me you know you can improve on your game somewhere. But I suppose. Unlike every manager that went before him, maybe he'd say, "Yeah, I have an idea on how that's going to work, and you know, here, here's what we're going to do, and Paul is going to do something with you, or we're going to set up a drill and training, or you know, as opposed to, 
yeah, you're crap at winning the ball in the air and it's up to yourself to work on it, you know, mm. and it's kind of like, you know, well, where does that leave you? You know, a manager, manager is example see. Of, of what you might have uh, improved with it. Yeah, we would have, we would have, you know, definitely, I suppose, winning, winning ball on the ground, you know, um, I suppose winning ball in the air, you know, I probably wasn't as prolific as catching a ball, you know, I'm not, you know, six foot four or anything like that, but I suppose um, what came to mind was my timing and, you know, how I could improve on that. And I think when I look back at uh, All Ireland, I suppose I can be proud of maybe, that that worked out for me and that the boys knew that if the ball was coming down that you know there wasn't a wing back going to catch it that you know I'd knock it down from and Tony or Podge or you know Conor McGrath would be there they kind of knew what the story was and it was kind of a tactic we used in the first All-Ireland where I suppose uh, William Egan was over on John Conlon and he was maybe got the better of him that you know most of the puckouts were going to come down on top of me so I suppose I had that sense of responsibility you know that I'd gone from maybe the year previous where they were petrified to puck the ball <laughs> down on top of me to being you know the only puckout option you know or such uh, in, in an All-Ireland final so that was definitely something that we worked on and thankfully it worked out. Mm. We're going to talk plenty more Claire as well but first of all I spoke to uh, Dara Fitzgibbon of Cork yesterday at the Board Gosh launch of the under 21s and here's what he had to say. Dara, so we're coming into Munster final weekend. Is it tough to not think about it and unwind? Yeah, I suppose. Um, I suppose there's a good buzz coming up to the on the Munster final week. I suppose uh, we're really looking forward to it. Um, after another repeat of Cork and Clare again, I think tickets are sold out. Um, there's going to be a good atmosphere. The weather's going to be good, so we're really looking forward to it. And it'll suit your fast running side. Yeah, I suppose um, uh, it won't be too bad. I suppose. Um, Look, we're just looking forward to it, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you do, what do you do to unwind when, you know, because you're in the hurling bubble every week, what do you do to try and distract yourself from it? I suppose uh, we tr- when, when we're not training or playing matches, I suppose just try and, try and unwind from it all, uh, just take our mind off of really play um, other sports, meet up with the lads, um, play a bit of PlayStation and like that. Yeah. So uh, tell me about this Fortnite video game that everyone's going on about. We're in a retro video arcade, games that I was reared on. But tell me about this uh, Fortnite, because I haven't played it. <laughs> I suppose um, I wouldn't be used to any of these games here, I suppose, when I was growing up. Uh, they, these games were kind of gone out of date, so... I ah, come on, a bit hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the PlayStation, I suppose, Fortnite, um, it's the real craze at the moment. Um, I suppose it's uh, a shooting game, really. Um, the last man of 100, really, uh, will be the winner. Last man of 100. And how, how long are we talking for a game here? I suppose if you're near, um, if you're near the about to win I suppose it would be less than about a, uh, a half an hour Right okay okay so did, were there any options for you to play other sports other than hurling growing up because you know it's a multi-sport sort of like you're from Charleville but it's a multi-sport county soccer rugby whatever Yeah I suppose when you're young you played played every sport that was available really you played soccer football play a bit of snooker or anything like that so um, but I suppose when uh, growing up then I got called into the Cochrane Rage uh, set up so I suppose hurling took, took um, premium from there really and talk about some of the players that you would have grown up watching. You know, you would have watched the All Ireland in 2013 as a teenager, with the likes of Laha, Patrick Horgan, who are all still playing as well. Is it surreal to be involved with them now? Yeah, I suppose um, to be able to play with players like Conor Lehan and, and Patrick Horgan. I suppose when we were watching them when they got to the All Ireland in 2013, I was only 14 or 15, so didn't being able to grow up and have the opportunity to play with these is uh, it's a great honour, really, and a great opportunity. I suppose to to see be able to play with these players. And who was your favourite player growing up? Um, I suppose Ben O'Connor would be my favourite player when I was growing up. Um, I suppose I'd been living locally to him and um, been out and dead. I suppose Ben and Jory, they won everything on the, all the way up. So um, And then to, he coaches at, uh, us at Charlotte as well at the moment, so it's great, great honour. What would you have learned from the matches against Cork, both last year in the Munster mm-hmm. final and this year as well? You beat them more or less injury time when you closed the game out. I suppose in any match we played against Clare, I suppose there's been nothing between us. Um, I think it's been two or three points every game we ever played. So um, I, suppose, I suppose the last day um, in the first round, I suppose we just took our scoring opportunities a bit better than they did. So we know that there's going to be nothing between us again on Sunday and we're just ready to go. So do you look at the games against Tipperary and think, yeah, we got nine points ahead? Um, or do you think, yeah, we should have closed that game? Limerick had 14 men, we should have cl- closed that game out. Or, do you know what, we're unbeaten coming up to this point. So that's the that's the main thing here. I suppose at the start of the year, we just took it as every performance that came, really. I suppose you're playing every team, so you just want to get a consistent performance. Um, I suppose... Um, I suppose we haven't been playing as good as we'd hoped but every time we went out we tried to improve and uh, at the end of the day we're in a Munster final so we would have taken that at the start of the year if you said that to us. Mm. Uh, what players did you play with all the way up in this Cork team? 
I suppose I would have played um, with Mark Coleman and Shane Kingston, Tim O'Mahony and Robbie Flynn, we'd all be the same age all the way up, so we would have started playing under 14 and I suppose for all of us to go and make it all the way up to the senior panel and to the senior team is, it has been great. Um, I suppose we've, I've known them since I've been under 14, so I've become great friends with them and, and the opportunity to play out in Turles or Park at Cueva Crow Park with them is, is, is huge. And how long did it take you to get used to the environment of being in a dressing room with, you know, the big names of Cork Hurl and Lahan and Horgan, etc.? I suppose um, when, when we came into the dressing room last year, they, they were great to, to uh, include us in anything really, and I suppose we fitted in um, straight away really, I suppose. Um, and it was, <coughs> I saw it's been great. To, as I said, being able to play with these players is, is a huge, great opportunity, and I had to go out and play with, in Park and even turn us with these lads, you know. So, um, looking forward to Sunday again to play with them again. Well, best of luck then. Thanks very much. Colin, imagine trying to keep into him his pace. It was never my job, I don't think. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't like to be chasing him at this stage. Yeah. Tony maybe might run after him. Tony Kelly, yeah, I'd, I'd say he wouldn't enjoy it. I doubt anyone would enjoy it. And we'll get on to Cork's pace because that's a huge asset they have. But um, I put up a poll there yesterday, and or actually earlier this morning, just seeing who would be the forerunners for the hurler of the year at the moment. And it's pretty clear at the moment. John Conlon seems to be right there up on top, 56%. Then Joe Canning, 24 TJ Reid, 13 Seamus Harnady, 7 um, There are plenty, like, the notable thing was that a lot of people got back to me straight away and say, why, why didn't you say Park Mannion? And I thought, you know what, that's a very fair point. Even well, I was going to say, why, didn't you put, why is there no Galway player included? Uh, Joe Canning so isn't from Galway, no? Well, I'm, I, I said, outside of a Joe, I wanted, Joe's going to be in every list. Why is it all forwards? Yeah, and, uh, a, it's all forwards, and B, he has to include Joe Canning in every list he puts together because otherwise he's just going to be accused of being a Canning hater again. As He, he doesn't even rate him in the top in the 10 hurlers in the country. But, but yes, a, I do. a Galway defender... I think should be up there. Whether it's yeah, Dahi Dahi Burke, Dahi Dahi Burke, Dahi Burke, Dahi Burke's been Mannion. I'd make a case for Conor Whelan and Conor Cooney too. Basically, half the Galway team here straight away, so which yeah. tells you how dominant they've been. Um, from who else would you nominate in there? Yeah, I suppose the one thing about this year is there seems to be a lot of players who are playing consistently well. Mm -hmm. But I think that's because they all have games. You know, they're running one after another. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I think if Dahi Burke is is in the form that he has been in the last year, I think it's very hard to look past him because. You know, trying to get a full back who who does that job is just you know it's hard to it's hard to come by you know to to manage that style of play and physically and you know the speed he has you know on top of it all he just seems to have they seem to exude confidence by having him back there. Yeah, and Patrick Horgan was another guy mm. mentioned there. One guy said to me, "How can you have Harnady ahead of him?" And we actually have another image here as well. Barry Cleary on Twitter uh, at Sheikh Barabbas. He put up this um, this chart basically that shows the amount of shots the players have gotten off and the amount of assists. And I thought it was incredible with Seamus Harnady that he's had 18 efforts and scored 210, which if you convert uh, goals to points is 16 out of 18 shots, not to mention 10 scoring assists as well. But John Conlon, 19 shots, 17 assisted efforts. So that's nine shots coming off him per game, which is absolutely huge. He's been incredible. And he's done it in every game. He started brilliantly against Cork down in Parky Cueve and he, he's been class. Another player I think he's just had an amazing summer is Keane Lynch and he sometimes maybe doesn't get the credit he deserves because he tends to flit in and out of games but he produces three or four huge moments in these matches and seems to do it all with the composure and the almost laid back nature of a guy who almost doesn't care whether he's there or not mm. he, he never seems to break sweat never seems to break into a full sprint but um, if Limerick are to come back into the championship he has to have a, a similar performance that he's put together in the group stages I think Tom Morrissey is another he's been that's brilliant, up there yeah. you know, he, he's had a lot of <coughs> shots got a few scores I think he got three points against I think um, Keane I think Keane seems to have that maturity about him I think at the moment that, yeah that he's just kind of he's after growing into a bit of a leader there I think with the Limerick team and I think the two Morrisseys, I think Dan Morrissey has actually been Brilliant, yeah. has been phenomenal for Limerick. I think you know his he his turnovers and you know his scoring even you know has been brilliant and like I think inevitably I suppose it's going to be picked off an All Ireland final winner. Like you that's know, always so the way. It's always the way. Yeah. You were robbed of an All Star uh, in twenty thirteen. I think the highest scorer ever not to get an All Star. <laughs> Bad All Star panel. <coughs> Bad All Star panel. It is the brilliance of the the success this year of the group stages, the round robin nature of it. That you could easily come up with nine or ten different guys who've played consistently well throughout. I'm not sure heading into July and any other championship season you could have done that. There's always yeah. two or three outstanding players, but um, there's been so much to look at and so much to choose from. Yeah, I'd like to see that change. You know, like in the sense that I'd love it if this year they were to pick players who played really well in the in the group stages. Mm. You know, the round robin because they have they've seen them now in four competitive games. Like you know, so somebody who played phenomenal. For instance, Clare don't win in All Ireland. You know, Clare lose on Sunday and lose the quarter final. You know, John Conlon has to be an All Star. Yeah. You know, because of what he has performed at. Like you know, it's. I think the days of picking. 
you know, seven of the All Ireland final, you know, winners and you know, six of the yeah. you know the runners up and you know two from the the, the two semi finalists just for the sake of it. I think you know, I think that has to change. That'll be really interesting bit. whether that changes. I was looking at your stats yeah. earlier. In Championship day with 07, last game in 2016, you only played 25 games, whereas Clare are going to play at least six this season, mm. if not more. And you must look at that structure and just think, that how great would that have been in your time? Sure, listen, like, you know, I was only chatting to Bugs about it there the other day and Paddy, and, like, listen, we would have absolutely loved it, but, like, I suppose we would have hated it to be knockout like it was just before our era. Mm. So, like, yeah. you know, we were probably lucky that we... You know, we had, you know, I suppose a small bit better than, you know, one game and out, like, you know, so um, you know, I suppose it'll keep evolving and stuff like that. But yeah, it is something that I suppose you look back on and think, you know, I'd love that. It's worth mentioning Daniel Kearney here as well. He was a, an all-star in 2013. I'm sure he's a guy <coughs> you had to look out for that year as well. Yeah. But he's from wing forward and a roving wing forward, definitely. 15 shots he's taken, 8 points scored, I think, and uh, 18 assists as well. So almost 9 scores uh, are scoring chances per game. Coming yeah, he's off having him. a bit of an Indian summer, I think, isn't he? Like, yeah, you know, he's, he's kind of, he was out of form or out of favour, I think, and out mm. of form, I think, the last two years. But... He's definitely, you know, he's definitely somebody that Clare are going to have to watch over on Sunday as well. Like, yeah, wh where do you see the game being won and lost on Sunday? Because one of the things about Cork is their game broke down against Tipperary when the rain came, and they started trying to do the short passing game, and it, it's obviously more difficult with a greasy ball. It's going to be match dry on um, on the sim on Simple Stadium on Sunday as well. So, where do you see this game being won? The the two things I look at is uh, where Clare fell down in the first round robin game and the Munster final probably last year. You know, you give. Anthony Nash time to pick out Mark Coleman or to pick out, you know, Damien Cahillan and they saunter up the field and, you know, Mark Coleman can score a point from, from his own 65, you yeah. know, and then suddenly, you know, you're in trouble because, you know, you're, you're watching that. So um, the, the other game I thought about was with Limerick down to 14 men and suddenly Graham Mulcahy and Seamus Flanagan put the Cork backs under phenomenal pressure and suddenly Mark Coleman was getting edgy. Um, you know, they were starting to drop a few balls, they were starting to, um, you know, not having the same time to pick out, you know, the other side of the field. And then the Limerick backs were able to push up on the Cork forwards and be tighter because the ball was coming in a bit poorer. Um, you know, I think Clare have to learn from the mistakes they've made in the last two games. You know, they have two of them now where they didn't push up and, uh, and man mark. Um, but at the same time, I suppose it's that catch-22, you know, are you going to leave the space in front of Patrick Horgan and, you know, the boys that the, you're going to get goal threats? So, mm. like, I think they have to manage it well, but I definitely think, um, you know, pushing Podge out, I, I had this discussion, pushing Podge out far enough that he's going to keep a cornerback well, busy. Well, let's, let's do it up here on the, on the tactics board as well. So if we'll, we'll put Claire and Claire in the blue, obviously, because there's a little touch of blue there. You can you can pretend they're Tipperary if you like. Obviously, <laughs> Cork could be in the red. But how do you see Claire setting up? Because J John Connell, I presume, is going to be the man here. Shane O'Donnell, yeah. is that is that how yeah. he's going to set yeah, up? Yeah, it has it has to be like, and I think these two boys have you know have done really well. I think if you if you watch them closely, like Shane moves in and around him, and I think you know Shane nearly occupies a full back sometimes and mm. stops his run, and John is gone, you know, out for a ball out here. And I think what Clare have been doing really well is the diagonal ball has been coming into the spaces rather than, you know, into the edge of the square. And I think they've been running onto it, but it hasn't been. You know, you're as well off shooting from out there than you are getting the ball inside here, you know. Yeah. Um, but I think Podge's role is going to be extremely important because I think maybe our problem in years gone by is Podge might have played out here or I might have played out here. And yeah. suddenly, suddenly Cork are, are leaving a man here, you know, that you're not occupying him. So he's just gone out, you're gone out to traffic out there, so yeah. you don't necessarily need to be marked that tightly. Yeah. You can, the sweeper or the spare man yeah. will be more value here. Whereas I think we'd prefer to see Podge maybe, you know, playing behind this line. Um, I think, you know, he plays behind that line, he's close enough to affect the game, he's close enough to score. Um, and suddenly then, you know, he has to come out here and he's keeping him busy. And it's 2v2. And I think, you know, if I had, you know, a, a book for Saturday and I, uh, I, I knew that John Condon and Shane O'Donnell were going to be against two Cork men inside, you know, I, I'd be going straight down to Petty Powers and hoping for a goal, back and forth <laughs> for a goal. Because Maybe Boylesport, because they sponsor the show. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Massive correction <laughs> sorry, there. Sorry. So, t Tony Kelly at times played at Wingford, so let's say that that's the way that sets up. Yeah. Uh, Tony Kelly, he will roam then as well, and that's going to create a bit of more space for Podge yeah. to roam into as yeah, well. Yeah, and I think, you know, Peter and David Reedy, you know, kind of play, uh, you know, not necessarily conventional wing forward like I was watching him from puck outs the last day and like Peter was here but he was suddenly making a run out to here for a puck out yeah. you know and kind of looking for it rather than being waiting out here you know I think Cork have the backs you know, I think Damien Cahillan followed him in the first round robin game and he was able to nullify his threat in the air you know yeah, I think yeah. they were worried maybe that I suppose after the Boston 
the Boston, uh, you know, where, where Peter was on the edge of the square and he caused serious damage, I think they were probably looking at him as being a serious threat like. Um, but I think they managed it, I think, in the last couple of games where, where, where David and, uh, and Peter have, have worked well and Podge is kind of, you know, in around them for puck outs, you know, maybe going with Peter for a break, you know, rather. And then Tony is kind of, is coming in from here. Which Just I think, getting on the break. Which I think is, is Tony's biggest asset. I yeah. think, you know, if you see him, like, we don't want to see Tony back here. And I think too often, maybe in the last, you know, year or two, we see him picking up balls off the half-back line and then suddenly delivering them. You know, I think Tony's serious threat for Clare is that, like, Peter and Podge come out here, ball breaks, you know, he suddenly he's broken the line. Mm. And, you know, you've Shane O'Donnell and John inside, you know, who are doing that. And the same, I think we've seen it with Colm Galvin a small bit, you know, and that probably helps that Colm Malone is here. Because so he'll hold the fort. Yeah, he, he, you know, and I wouldn't be surprised if Cahal Malone is following Darrell Fitzgibbon on, set on Sunday, you know, because Cullum Galvin's game will suffer if he's following, you know. But then again, Cullum might like the idea of, you know, trying to better him too, like, you know, because. Maybe cancel him out. Would, would that be a bigger win for Clare or a bigger win for Cork? Yeah, well, I Because Bill I Cooper's probably not going to score more than a point and he'd probably end up proving me wrong, but. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Listen, like, I suppose it's always, you know, you could say it here now and suddenly somebody will show up and they'll, you know, yeah. rattle off four points, but. Um, I think Cahill's work rate, you know, he's been, he's been selfless, I think, you know, in, in, in the way he's played. And I think he has allowed Tony, um, you know, I think everybody in Clare was shouting for Tony and, and Cullum to play midfield. Um, you know, personally, I don't think it works. Very attack-minded, isn't it? Yeah, you know, and I think they're, they're very similar players. You know, I think you need to have that balance. You know, I think if you look at every team that has it, um, you know, look at Galway, I suppose, with David Burke and Johnny Cohn. Like, you know, Johnny Cohn doesn't venture too far up there, you know, and suddenly when he does, you know, he's back and he's minding the fort, like, you know, and allowing David Burke to that bit of freedom. And I think Cahill has, you know, done a phenomenal job. I think he's probably somebody that doesn't get the credit maybe that he deserves. Um, he's been working really hard and I think he'll... going to want to hold to some degree David uh, Fitzgerald or... David yeah, McInerney, yeah. David McInerney, yeah. sorry, behind him as well. Yeah. So how do you see Cork going after Clare there? So let's say that's Conor Cleary there. Would they put the likes of Lahan there? Now they don't have Alan Cadigan this year who scored 1-4 Thankfully. last year. Destro <laughs> destroyed Clare last year, really. Yeah. So <laughs> what threats would you be worried about Clare? Because we're going to have the likes of Harnady, Patrick Horgan. Yeah, they a big spread of big scorers. Yeah, I think maybe, you know, they've, they've looked at maybe David McInerney I suppose Mark and Pat Horgan the last couple of times. Um, I think personally, I think David will be looking to you know to, to get one over him. I think this time. Yeah. Um, you know, I think he was very good against Seamus Flanagan in, in the Limerick game. You know, and he seems to be coming into his own. Also, I think Pat O'Connor doesn't get half the praise that he deserves. I think you know they were calling for him to be dropped after the first game. Um, you know, he's a phenomenal attitude. Um, his dedication is brilliant. You know, it's no wonder he's the team captain. You know, you don't make somebody team is he, captain. Is he that leader, yeah? Yeah, 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 definitely. You know, you see the catch he made, you know, in the in the last minute of the tip game. Yeah. You know, going up there, you know, he just he just has that attitude um, that's, you know, you, you couldn't write away for it. Like, you know, so, like, he, the matchups are going to be extremely important. I think David is probably going to pick up Pat Horgan. Um, but Jack is coming into confidence, and I think knowing Jack that Brown, he, yeah. yeah, knowing that he doesn't have Alan Caddington to follow around, I think is you know is going to be a big plus for and him. He won't spare the timber. Yeah, no, <laughs> never does, never does. Um, but Connor, Connor, I think has been has been good, but like, I think that's where Colin Malone is going to be twofold. I think you know if he sits back, um, you know, just minding the fort a small bit, that maybe he can cover that space in front of Connor Lahan, you know, that he doesn't get that free rein. And they didn't really have that in Parky Cooper. I'm sure they didn't. No. They did look exposed for no. an awful lot of the yeah. game. And you mentioned the role that Tony Kelly's going to play. Daniel Carney could end up playing a similar enough role. And you already mentioned him, Shane. The amount of opportunities he's getting mm -hmm. by never ceasing in his movement. He's always on the move. And for that reason, he just always seems to be on the shoulder. Whether it's Lahan in there in that centre forward position, or a Harnady, who's they know. Carney's almost like a, just a wasp sniffing around the place. He'll, he'll end up just catching ball and getting balls popped off to him. And I mean, how do you how do you stick with them? And that yeah. so Malone just could have he he could end up having two or three jobs to do on Sunday. And how do you cope with that in a monster final? Yeah, and I think you know there's talk of of Shane Murray, you know, not being available. Like, and Shane obviously would have been a prime candidate to follow Daniel Carney, you know, with pace, pace and stuff like that. But I also do think that one of the things that Clare didn't have in the first round robin game was Jamie Shanahan. Yeah. And, you know, Jamie's going to be extremely important here. He was brilliant here. as the sweeper against, or the spare man against Limerick he as well. He uses the ball so intelligently, and I think the one thing that Jamie has maybe that the, the rest of our half-back line don't have is the ability to score from distance. Mm. You know, so I think if, you know, boys are working the ball here and suddenly Cork are working back and they give a ball to Jamie, then suddenly what are you asking? You're asking a Cork or a forward then to come out and, you know, try and mind him. Suddenly then we've the advantage here. 
you know, we're, we're 2v3, you know, in, in, in our way. So, like, I think it is going to be intriguing, the matchups and stuff like that, but I think the one thing that Clare have fallen down on is giving Cork too much time here. And when you give Cork too much time here, they're beating the half-back line. And they're beating the half-back line and suddenly they're in front of here and this is the danger zone, you know, and I think that's what we need to stop on, on Sunday. I'm sensing a bit of confidence for a Clare win here. Yeah, I think we have to learn from our mistakes. You know, I think we've had two cuts of them now in the last 12 months and um, I think the boys have got their matchups really well, you know, in Tipperary and against Limerick and I think uh, they, they are learning. I think it took them a bit of time maybe to... To, to see that inter-county you know, senior level is probably a bit different to under-21, but you know, I have confidence in them that they seem to be doing their homework right and getting the matchups right. Dave, how do you see it going? Well, one of the features for me in the draw or in the, the game in the round robin structure in Park Kiki was Clare's mindset when they broke inside the Cork 45. They were they had goals on their mind pretty much for the whole game, but particularly in the first half, they just didn't keep the scoreboard ticking over as they should have done. And they, they put 26 points on Limerick. And I wonder, was that just the way that game went or was it a maybe a little bit of an insight into how their mindset has changed over the last month or so that maybe they are being a little more pragmatic, they're being a little more conservative at the right times in the right areas and, and they won't always be going for the jugular, and particularly in the first quarter. You just get a few scores on the board, you get yourself settled because it led to them pretty much chasing the game for the entire afternoon down at Parky Cave. Yeah, I think it's one thing that probably uh, as supporters and people watching on, maybe it's something that this team definitely needed to work on. You know, I think sometimes they overemphasize the going for goal. And I suppose quite often, maybe in the last year, they've been hitting, you know, 10 wides from distance. So I think um, on the field, they're going to have to manage that. I think, um, you know, you can't, you, uh, that's where you need your leaders to come into play. Um, you know, Tony hits a couple of wides and John needs to be roaring, you know, let it in the next time. You know, or suddenly John wins the first high ball inside and causes rack. Then it's a case of, well, let's keep plugging it. You know, if the next ball doesn't come, then it, 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 it needs Tony then to make the decision or Colm Galvin or David Reedy to make the decision, well, I'll take a point here now and we'll keep the scoreboard taking over. Yeah. And I think that maturity needs to come, you know, where they can make that decision on the field. Um, you know, I suppose I, I probably would have been annoyed maybe that, you know, I heard Don Maloney say after the game, you have to take risks in the first round robin game. But like, at what stage does a risk become, you know, a catastrophe? I think he was like, he know? was trying to deflect yeah. maybe some of the criticism yeah. from the forwards, and he like he's not going to come out after the game and say, yeah, you're right. They probably were a bit poor with their decision yeah, making. Course. We of really course. shouldn't be gone for goals as often as we were did. Were they poor with the decision making, or was it just at times a the, time the pass, pass was poor? Left, particularly maybe it was an okay yeah, decision. We, we were talking about Tony Kelly and the, how you get the best out of him and get him into a game. There were one or two little pop passes that Tony was yeah. very close to being on he the could end. Have had three goals that day. Yeah, and look, and then the narrative is completely different, but. I mean, Shane O'Donnell in particular for me is a guy who picks up some incredible positions. I don't know if there's been a better man at winning his own ball in this year's championship, but then what does he do with it? Always looking for the layoff. Mm -hmm. I'd love him just to be selfish and just put, even if he's on the 21, just take the Point. ball over the bar yeah. and suddenly he's got a couple under his belt. It doesn't really matter then what he does from play scoring wise for the rest of the game. He's kind of made his contribution. Then he can maybe look to bring other guys into the game. I'm torn on this game because, you know, just to name some the spread of scores for Cork, Harnedy 2-10 from play, Lahan, Kingston, Horgan 1-10 from play each, Fitzgibbon, Kearney 8 points. And then Clare, like you might have John Conlon going to town in the first half, Tony Kelly might have a quiet Colin first Galvin. half like against Limerick. Yeah, Colin Galvin. Peter Colin Duggan, you know, Peter Jamie Duggan. Shannon chipping in with a few. You keep naming them. Yeah, uh, like so I'm torn, the boys sports have it at even, I don't know what way to call it. It'll be a shootout though, will it? Yeah, I, I I can't imagine I can't imagine it being any other way. Um, like I think this Clare team has set out their stall. I think that it's going to be that way. You know, I think they've they've worked out that maybe uh, sitting back and waiting for the game to to kind of come to them isn't you know going to work because suddenly I think then they're chasing the game with you know five or six minutes to go. I think they have to have a go, but a uh, go intelligently. Mm. You know, we could stay talking about this yeah. game for another half an hour, and I'd love to, but we're going to have to talk about Galway Kilkenny as well in the Leinster final. Um, what's his name? <laughs> what's his name? Di Regan was on uh, <laughs> off the ball. <laughs> what's his boss was on off the ball last night. Di Regan was on off the ball uh, talking about Galway and Kilkenny. Now I would also agree that Galway certainly are not in the pantheon of of where Kilkenny were. Are they moving towards it? They may be very well moving towards a period of dominance. The extreme dominance that Kilkenny held over the championship, no, no, I don't see that. And the reason I don't see that is because they are, they're so balanced in every aspect. But when you talk about JJ, Tommy, you talk about Owen Larkin, you talk about Henry, particularly three of those four are three of the greatest players that ever played the game. Now, 
Very few teams in your lifetime will ever will ever have that. So I think Galway are, are superbly balanced. I, I really think they're a, a brilliant side. But I would I would absolutely not go as far as to say, you know, that they're, they're stretching to where Kilkenny were. It doesn't mean they won't dominate. It doesn't mean that. But I do think they'll win the weekend because I think they're very strong. And I think Kilkenny are in transition. There's 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 notable uh there's notable guys there, obviously. Reed and and Wally up front in particular have been the mainstay to me over the last 12 months mm. and he's supplemented him with these young very very good guys but they're certainly not great yet greatness has to be earned over a period of time I think they're good I think they may be coming but I think they're coming against the best hurling team in the country Colin what do you think can you go from being a team that serially was considered to be mentally frail Galway because they kept coming up short to all of a sudden being bulletproof like Galway thinking all Ireland does that yeah does it didn't happen to you and yeah well <laughs> they probably had a different journey to us though yeah you know I think they've they probably suffered heartbreak maybe a bit earlier than us um, I think we won ours well some of us I suppose suffered a bit of heartbreak all right before but I think some of our younger players maybe didn't mm. um, you know that they they came on the scene and it was you know straight in it was an all Ireland and um, you know, it was kind of different. Maybe their journey, Galway's journey, has been, you know, I think a small bit. And they've come up against Kilkenny a couple of times, and but like they're just the traditional. Um, I wouldn't like to be coming up against their their forwards. I think it's just, um, you know, they just break you down. I think they just wear you down. Like you know, Joe Ken- uh, Joe Kenning, Joe Cooney, Connor Cooney, uh, Connor Whelan. They are just physical men. Just well, you you played in the twenty thirteen quarter final when mm. you when you beat them quite convincingly. I think it was seven points down in Thurles. Yeah. Your your last game for Clare, I believe, is the twenty sixteen All Ireland quarter final. I, I don't think you played that long that day, yeah. but. Can you tell me how they, you probably played them in league as well, how they became, like physically have they grown in that period of time or how have they changed? Yeah, I think, um, you know, when you look at maybe 2013, uh, I was marking Joe, Co- Joe Cooney and he was going back. Yeah. You know, so like definitely the personnel, uh, they were counting on Joe Kenning. Um, you know, I think he still had a good game that day. Um, they didn't have Conor Whelan. Um, Carl Mannion wasn't there. Um, you know, the Flynn wasn't there. Park Mannion probably wasn't there. Park Mannion wasn't there. Dahi Burke. Um, Burke. Uh, like they've, they've we're seen, naming the spine of the team. Yeah, they've that seen, is there. Uh, Rode McInerney wasn't playing. Yeah. Um, like you know, so suddenly you have these men who stepped up. Uh, Connor Cooney has um, taken on the mantle of being, you know, probably the, um, I suppose m- maybe this year. Different this year, maybe you know behind John, John Conlon as the go-to ball winner, maybe inside in the full forward line. Like you know, the two of them are fighting it out. I think um, you know for being the, the main man inside. Um, but suddenly they're just they're six foot four men who just break you down. They work extremely hard. You know, I think Conor Whelan's work rate. You know, while he often gets uh, scores, I think his work rate is just phenomenal. And I think when you have players like that who are just turning over cornerbacks and, you know, being close to goal and then suddenly to bring on Johnny Glynn and, you know, Jason he just, Flynn and he just wears Burke. them down even more, you know. So, like, um, and then you have somebody minding the house like Dahi Burke and Gerard McInerney and uh, Park Mannion. I could keep naming them. They just seem to have a great balance at the minute. Um, that uh, They all seem to know their role. They seem to have that comfortableness, you know, with one another that they know their jobs and stuff like that. Um, but I think probably their, their biggest thing is their physicality or forwards, I think. Yeah, it's grievous bodily harm most of the time going in against those Galway guys. Can I ask you, Dave, what, what did you make of the comments from Davy Burke? He said of Galway, or Kilkenny of old, they were kind of this unbeatable team. But I think we changed that in 2012 and made them look beatable when they beat them in the Leinster final. Obviously, their good team was coming to a bit of an end. You know, they still fear us in a way, I think, anyway. They still fear playing Galway. I love them. We 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 hear these kind of comments so seldom, and <clears throat> even when Kilkenny were in there at the height of their dominance and they were going for the five in a row, whenever it looked like they were going to be playing Galway, people still reference two thousand and one. They reference that epic semi final two thousand and five, yeah. and the the verdict was always, look, no matter where Galway are, they're the one team that can just spook Kilkenny unlike any other, and so maybe Dahi Burke's drawing a little bit on that, but the. The self confidence of it is what really I love to hear because we so rarely do we hear any player that's as honest as he was there to say that you're coming up against a team in a big game this weekend. You know, I think they fear playing us. No other player or other team would have said that. And you talked about 2013 and Clare and, and how you know you kind of booked the trend that theory that you have to lose one to win one. Clare kind of flew in the face of that. But I think Galway actually do back up that old cliche. Oh, they lost a few. Whereas they lost a few that go through an awful lot of heartache to get to the point they were last season. And if 
you're a county like Tipperary or a Cork that you have that traditional swagger about you. We're Tip, we're Cork. No matter where we're at, we always think we can win. Whereas I don't think Galway ever had that. And so for them winning in All-Ireland doesn't sate their hunger and mean they come back without the edge next year. It actually just gives them the self-belief that they didn't have over the last decade or even going back over the last 29 years back to 88. So now you come back into 2018, all that baggage is gone. They still have the same physicality, the same skills, the same appetite, but now they have this real real swagger, this level of self-confidence that is backing it up. And that's why they look bulletproof at the moment. Colin, Galway have averaged 2.22 per game, which like 28 points is going to be hard to beat. And I mean, if they've done that over four games, we know they're consistent. Um, when you look at the, the Kilkenny team, however, like their top scorer is TJ Reid. He's managed 2-3 from play in four games. And I know we had him up in the hurler the year contenders. Obviously an unbelievable player. But if he's got just five scores overall, from play, and if their goalkeeper with six frees is their joint third highest scorer, where are Kilkenny going to get the scores? They got just three from play against Galway in Pierce Stadium. Yeah, I think it's something they've probably struggled with maybe, you know, um, in the transitional period, you know, that they haven't, you know, replaced maybe some of the players, you know, like it's very hard to scoring forwards are, I suppose, are the hardest things to come by. Um, yeah. You know, you, you often talk about it, we were just discussing it there. You know, they're, just, they're just not things that. Um, uh, it's like hens to eat, really. Like you know, at intercounty level, like er, an intercounty team can put six scoring forwards out there. Yeah. You know, and I think when you look at that, you know how how unnatural that is. Like you know that you need these workers and stuff like that as well. Um, but like, would Wally be considered a free scoring forward? You know, he works hard and he chips in with his two or three points. But you know, will he get you that? You know, one three, one four. You know, it's hard to know. Um, and I think that's something that. They're finding out a bit more about their young lads. Um, they still have Richie Hogan and Colin Finley. They've got a bit more hurling into them. Um, That's key, I think. Isn't yeah, it? I wouldn't. I talk about scoring forwards. They are yeah. exactly that. But if they don't get an awful lot more out of that pair on Sunday, you don't see them having a chance of winning the game. Yeah, and I think you know that's something. You know, while while I suppose we love on the outside to hear about you know David Burke saying that about Galway and you know the thought process you know you just don't want it to come back and bite you in the arse you know and and um, I think Kilkenny will be looking at them comments and you know, they'll be pinned up in a dressing room wall I'm sure somewhere and you know Brian Cody and everything else you know they'll be looking to take them down and I think they're probably coming in a bit under the radar um, I think everybody's talking about Galway and I think everybody was talking about tipping the league final yeah. um, you know and, and Brian Cody I suppose um, you know turned that one over but I, I find it hard to see past Galway. You know, I think while Kilkenny will give him a game, I think Galway will just wear him down, I think. They probably will. And we're, we're going to look at some of the movement that Galway have had. We have a couple of images here as well. So the point is that generally Cody learns from his previous games. But we see here Joe Canning's in the middle here. He's drawn out towards his own half back line, his own 60. Yeah, you can see him there at the midfield point. He's going back towards his own half back line. What do Kilkenny need to do to ensure that this sort of space isn't open around the middle, that Cahill Mannion at the bottom of the screen isn't on his own like that, Colin? Yeah, um, like Joe seems to have really taken on the mantle of being that kind of playmaker. Mm. Um, as well as kind of drifting in and out and stuff like that. You have um, to follow him, like because he could score from ninety yards. Of course you do, you yeah. know. And uh, I think uh, you know he'll probably he'll probably flood the middle. Um, you know, I think he'll pick physical men. Um, Ooh, Cody, Cody will. yeah, I think yeah. he'll pick physical men. I think to to sit in the middle. I think, um, you know, I, I don't know was Connor Fogarty playing the first day when when they played. Um, I know he was coming back into it and stuff like that. And he certainly is a man that will you know mind that middle ground and you know work hard for that. Um, uh, but like you know, they'll definitely be picking. I suppose their half forward line are going to come out, and they're going to hope. I think um, Cody's definitely going to hope that it's a battleground in the middle of the field, and that the scores are kept down. Um, and, and like Richie Hogan wasn't risked that day. He was named in the twenty six, not brought back. Can Colin Fenley and Richie Hogan come in and turn it, turn it around for Kilkenny, Dave? You'd love to see how they've been performing in these infamous A versus B games over the last couple of weeks. So we we don't know how much hurling they have in them. They're definitely undercooked in terms of that championship intensity that Undercooked you need. Undercooked or you... not quite as good as they were? <clears throat> well, I'm not going to sit here and say that Fenley or Hogan are not as good as they were, but injuries take their toll. I mean, it'll be pretty spectacular if they do return to, certainly from Hogan's point of view, to hurler of the year form. But the biggest problem they had in Salt Hill was that they were physically beaten all over the field yeah. from the start to the finish. And I know the circumstances were different. Maybe the stakes weren't quite as high. Kilkenny were a little undercooked. And the surface wasn't great that day either in Salt Hill. But you can't lift any more weights. You can't get bigger. You can't grow an extra couple of inches in the weeks they have had since that 
round robin game and against Troy. God, oh, you've boy, tried. tried. I've taken everything you can Heels possibly take. <laughs> and I just wonder, it was interesting to see that uh, Richie Power was saying they have to ch quicken their game and avoid these kind of one-on-one uh, -on -one physical duels, the aerial duels that Galway are always going to win. And if they can work it down the field, keep themselves constantly on the move and avoid those kind of clashes, then maybe they can... Uh, ask a question of Galway that they haven't actually been asked this summer yet? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think Cody will pick his most physical line that's available to him, I think. You know, actually I'd, try and hammer the hammer and I'd, just put I'd, it up I'd, to I them. think so, yeah. I think he'll try and keep the game as close as possible for as long as possible and hope that they're in the game with, you know, 15 minutes to go and then maybe bring on some of your, your new guns, your, your new boys who will start to move them around a small bit, I think. And just to call it then, Dave? You can't look past Galway. Mm, yeah. No, that's Colin. No, unfortunately. Okay, I'd go the same as well. Um, during the week, last week, I spoke with Joe Quaid, who's the Kildare Hurlick manager, and at the time, he was telling me that he was he was unhappy with basically how the schedule fell. They were going into the Christie Ring Cup final, and they won that. And now, a week later, on this weekend, they have to play Antrim in a promotion relegation playoff. So essentially, one t the Joe McDonough Cup is going to be uh, moved from six teams to five. Uh, Kerry already gone down. Sorry, Meath already already gone down and now it's going to be Antrim against Kildare in the uh, promotion relegation this weekend so here's what he had to say about the scheduling. Do you like the tiered system the Joe McDonough the, the way that the round robin is in the Liam McCarthy level as well? Yeah it's, it's a good system the one issue I would have with the tier system from where we are um, is that the Christy Ring winners this year have to go out and play Antrim in a playoff a week later mm. like the Christy Ring is the pinnacle of the, the boys' year. I'm sure they're entitled to go in and celebrate it. Not have to go back training to try and get into the, the Joe McDonough a week later. I agree with the playoff, but it should only be the bottom team. Me have been relegated already. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get less teams playing at a higher level, which makes absolute n n nonsense. So it does. Um... So I don't know what, what way are the thought process behind it. Is it to do with fixtures? Is it to do with revenue? Like the Joe McDonald hasn't even got television coverage this year. It's absolutely ridiculous. Mm. Like they're, they're promoting this, um, but we haven't seen one match. Um, so we don't know how good or bad it is. There's people whinging that awfully are gone down, but that's a traditional holding county, yes. Are they doing enough? Probably not at the moment. Why should they stay up and counties like Carlow, Westmead, Leash, like that, not get the chance to go up and play at the top level? So I think there's a lot of good there this year, but it needs it needs a nice little bit of tweaking as well to get it right. Thanks, Joe. No problem. Yeah, and it's definitely come more into the media focus during the week with the Newbridge or, or nowhere for the Kildare footballers. And I think that's kind of mobilised the hurlers too, that they've got together with the Antrim hurlers and released a statement about how this isn't right and how the Joe McDonough shouldn't be reduced to five teams. We've got a tweet uh, conversation up here as well between Anthony Daly and Joe Quaid from during the, week, during the week, which kind of highlights where exactly they're at. Just waiting for that to come up on screen there so I can read it out to you. But essentially the tone is the same, that this has to, to change, that you can't be expecting a team to win a Christie Ring Cup final and go out again within a week and not even get a chance to celebrate it. We've uh, That tweet hasn't come up just yet. But I think we've got... Uh, oh, there it is, actually. Yeah, so Anthony Daly said, great points made by Colin O'Rourke. By the way, the hurlers getting a fair screwing too, having to play in Armagh 12... 45 for promotion, seven days after winning their All-Ireland. Surely could have been given a week, if not automatic. Joe Quaid said, it's an absolute disgrace on both fronts, Dalo, but let's call a spade a spade here. Croke Park do not want Antrim back down into Christie Ring. Neutral venue, question mark. Nice to Armagh is two hours, 30 minutes. Belfast to Armagh, one hour. And I think Joe had another tweet, uh, tweet since. Mark Maloney, one of the players, put out the statement with hashtag we deserve better. Joe says, fair play to both the Kildare and Antrim hurlers. Hope the powers that be in Croke Park sit up and take notice. The promotion and improvement of hurling in all counties needs to be number one priority, not just the elite. Well done, lads. Proud of you. We have on the line the Antrim hurling manager, Terence McNaughton. Terence, how are you doing? How are you, Sam? How are you Not too bad, not too bad. Can you tell us what's your take on this situation and how did you get involved with the Kildare hurlers to put out this statement? Well, it was actually uh, Kildare Hurlers approached Donham Hurlers and we've more or less the same view on this, but from a totally different angle, maybe from our point of view. And like I understand, you know, like, yes, you want Christian, and the 
bigger picture here from the Christy Young one or whoever it may be. If you want Christy Young and that there and, and, and you don't want to play off, you'll come back to play it again next year. So to keep the momentum going, if you're a player in Kildare, do you go to America for summer or do you stay in one another? Christy Young does it have the same emphasis as that there, but for if you did with the up with Joe McDonough, it's a sign of progression and that there. Like it's, there's, I agree with a lot of things. The, the Joe McDonough uh, Cup should stay at six. It was very, very competitive this year. Extremely competitive. And it was a great competition. Why to bring it down to five? I've, I can't see any logic behind it because everybody involved in it reckons it stayed at six and not there. But uh, we were uh, talking all the way from the final. And they we were we we're third place in that league, but we have because of the head to head release, uh, we're in a relegation playoff. And to come from that high and people and trying to get people committed and then clubs get involved and that there, it's a nightmare for ourselves as well, trying to keep people together for this long. And boys going to America and different things and wanting to get away. And maybe clubs get involved in with football matches on Friday night. And it's, it's not an ideal set up for ourselves like and did you have you lost any players that you would have had available throughout the Joe McDonough run yeah we have there's no doubt about it with a few with America and a few injured and, and the momentum and uh, with our inner football fixtures on Friday night we don't know what's going to happen committed up it's not a big preparation playing a football match and then heading off to our mom Saturday to play a relegation playoff ever yeah, and were there any thoughts at any stage that you might just boycott this game or did you agree, look, we're just going to show solidarity with Kildare because in the wider sense this is wrong and it needs to change but we're going to play the game anyway? No, well, we entered the competition and we knew the rules before we started so we honoured the thing and we said uh, we knew this was coming down the line no matter who it was so uh, in a pride stake or principal stake we decided no, we are definitely going to play this game for ourselves, but it's wrong, it's wrong that we have to play it, and it's wrong that we have to play it. And, and like the, it's been highlighted all through the year that the Joe McDonough Cup got no, no coverage at all. Like there's more, there's more inches given in papers to Dermot Connolly going to America, and that's not against Dermot. He's one of my favourite footballs too. But like, like uh, I believe Copac has to put a for want of a better word, an ambassador that looks after these competitions that you can deal with. There's nobody speaking for us. There's nobody in... And I understand Crow Park. Like there's more people going to Hull 16 to watch Dublin footballers and maybe watch the whole of the Christy Ring or the Joe McDonough. But, but that's not... We're trying to promote the game and have been as long time in Ulster and it's a football-dominant county. And, and every every scrap we can get we're trying to keep people involved and not there like there's nobody running around giving up them hurlers or Kildare hurlers cars or holidays at the end of the year and things like that there and it's hard to keep momentum going it's hard to get boys motivated and, and the same as Kildare ourselves and the rest of the teams were picking from a smaller base than than the larger counties and if you lose two or three players or for whatever reason it changes your whole season like we had serious bad luck this year in every game we played nearly like we with a few injuries and we lost a few injuries and that changes the look of our team. But that's life, that's that's our problem. We're trying to solve that. But for us to get into a Christie Ring or to Kildare, you know, it's doing hardly no good in these counties. Mm. I think and just one final question then as well. Uh, the Joe McDonough final is on this weekend, Carlo and Westmead. How do you see that one going? Because you've you've obviously sent out teams against both of them this year. Yeah, well it's <laughs> It's just very, very hard in the call. It's extremely hard in the call. Like when you sit down and look at the two teams, uh, Carlo's a big, strong, physical team. You would think that uh, the open of Crow Park might sit them better, but we have played Carlo in Crow Park and and the Christian final ourselves, and out there, it's extremely hard in the call. But I just have a sneaky thing for Westmeath, and I know that for no reason I could argue both games to be honest but I just feel that this could be twice weeks yeah okay alright well thank you very much Terence McNaughton for joining us on the Hurling Show we appreciate it 
No problem. Cheers. All the best. So, um, how would you see this one going? You, you, you actually boarded with one of the Kildare players at one stage, did you? Yeah, Mark uh, Maloney there. He came down to Flannan's when we won a hearty together. Luckily enough, but like you know, he's been fighting the crusade for Kildare hurling for a long, long time, and you know, um, I suppose it's 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 very unfortunate. I think. Um, I, I suppose Munster is probably the biggest problem for the GA. You know, I think if they could viably have six teams in in Munster, um, you know, competitive teams, then why not have six teams in Leinster and six teams in the John McDonough and six teams in the Christie Ring and so on? Um, but I just think it's a lack of maybe foresight on the GA's behalf this year. You know, it's kind of like, you know, Kildare, well done, yeah, you won it, but you know, unfortunately, you're not going to go up. Like, so where does that put them? You know, if they if if they lose, you know, uh, against Antrim, so like, does that say you know we're not going to promote, you know, winning and you know what what good is it if you win it? You know, if you don't go up, like, it devalues the Christie Ring Cup to not have that incentive that yeah. you win it. Yeah, it's an All Ireland title, but the huge incentive is that you're up then and you get to test yourself at the next level the following year. And these guys may not win another All Ireland or may not win another big Croke Park based final in their careers, and they have to celebrate it. Mm. By all accounts, they were out a couple of nights after winning that game, and you know they could go out and lose to Antrim anyway, whether they stayed off the sauce or not. You have to take these moments. You work bloody hard enough to get yourself in that position. And so you can't argue with them going out and savouring the fact that they've won the Christian Ring Cup. But then they have to come back, what, four or five days later, get their heads back into it, get themselves back training. It's it's not easy, it's not fair. And even look at club teams, they might <coughs> win a first county title in 20 or 30 years and they're out in the provincial championship six days later. So it's like I think the GA in general needs to look at that. A couple of tweets in from Easel Cody saying, hashtag the hurling show without Michael Verney inevitably showing off the guns and or pins in this weather. This is not right. I th- Colin, do you want to throw those pins up there in the oh, table? You've got good. them out. I'm good. You have them shaved as well, I noticed. <laughs> and then another tweet in. The said, dirty dig. <laughs> <laughs> Lads, I think sometimes the All Star panel pick a couple of controversial heads just to heat up the debate. It's not on. An All Star is hard earned. That comes from Mark as well. And I, I, I'm on the football panel, mm. and that is not the case. Like we don't just disgraced. we don't lob grenades out there just do. just into the public domain and all say you know what lads <laughs> yeah. we don't like how is Dear McConnell only got two all stars or is it one all star it's one isn't it see you're a disgrace well I haven't I haven't always been there <laughs> <coughs> backtrack immediately all oh, right okay no but the point that that listener slash viewer is making isn't valid we we don't just pick a guy that we don't necessarily believe in I'm only speaking from the footballer all star panel but put in there anyway just so we can generate a bit of debate outside the, the system. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. It's Look, but the way that you, both codes have changed, it's so fluid now, particularly football, trying to pick out a cornerback from a corner forward in comparison to what it was 15, 20 years ago. You find yourself in a really awkward spot when it couple of, comes to a couple of the positions. That's where we get most of our grief from the footballing side of things. And I know the hurling committee gets equal abuse from time to time. And rightly so. And rightly so. You're right, he's angling for a spot on the, on the committee. You just, you're going to have to speak to the right people. I do, John Fogarty, is, is he the head of it? And he hasn't... He hasn't as far as I know, John's John Fogarty, on, sort me out. He's on both panels, I think, yeah. Uh, we don't actually have time to show the Rory O'Connor video this week, but we'll definitely show that next week, the parts that are, haven't gone out of date, of course. But uh, just looking into the weekend, final sort of word, the Joe McDonough Cup, I think the likes of... Tommy Doyle is a player that you really like as well on the Westmead team. Westmead, Carlo, how do you see it going? Yeah, and unfortunately, I suppose, or fortunately, um, you know, we have found ourselves playing Westmead and Carlo. You know, we've gone to both places in the last, you know, five or six years. You know, before the All Ireland was won, and luckily come out of there alive in both <coughs> cases. So, um, you know, they're put any intercounty team in there um, mm. against Westmead or, or Carlo in their home ground. You know, they will give you plenty of it, and you know, for anybody to think that. Their um their ability isn't as good as that you know it's I think it's just it's a, it's a bit of ignorance I think but um Westmeath I think you know just following the results and you know kind of looking at a few of them I think um you know it might be their year. Okay, uh, Dave. Any final word now? We're going to throw to uh, a Joe Quay video as well. It's spoken in a, in a bit more depth about a couple. I'd have one question: Which is the bigger game for Carlo and Westmeath this weekend's game or the one that follows it? Because they're both going through no matter what, yeah. win or lose. Yeah. Mm. Very like I say. guess, <laughs> is that a rhetorical guess, question? It, well, I don't know if there is an answer. This weekend's game is the one that will have the most influence on 2019. Obviously, mm. you win that, well, then you're, you've booked yourself a place at the table with the big boys. Whereas, you have a possibility of getting into an All Ireland series if yeah. you somehow manage to create a serious shock the following week against either Wexford or Limerick. There's a lot to a lot to think about, a lot to look forward to. But I get you want to be an All Ireland medalist. 
that's what the that's what to say this weekend. I think this year I think is or this game this weekend is probably a bit more important, I think. You mm. know, setting your stall out, being in Leinster next year. Yeah. You know, yeah. or whatever is or you know, fighting to be in it or whatever is, is, is really important, I think, for their progression. And I guess if you win it you're in bonus territory then and then and then the yeah. following week becomes the, your biggest game. Yeah. Okay, let's I think we're gonna say goodbye to the two of you there because we're gonna go no to problem. Joe Quaid and then we're gonna look at the betting with Boysport after that. Thank you very much, okay. Colin. Thank you very much, Dave. Cheers. Limerick were fairly poor against uh, Clare in the what was a de facto Munster semi-final. What went wrong? Was it the third week in a row? Is it Clare better than we thought or Clare aren't, or Limerick aren't as good as we thought? Um, I'm hoping that it was uh, Limerick being cute and uh, taking off forwards and putting on more full-backs and that uh, to try and go maybe the, the more uncustomary route but probably the easier route in all Ireland final um, they'll probably backfired along the way because they'll probably end up meeting Galway and Kilkenny along the way but look definitely the third week seems to be affecting uh, teams now I've heard of managers going away talking to premiership teams and rugby teams uh, how to cope with recovery and that but they should have just come to us in Kildare we've been doing it for the last three years we play three matches in 14 days as well and welcome to our world like um, but Innes is always a hard place to go and play Clare you know and the fact th- the way that it was set up this year was definitely um, it was always going to boil down to that match Um Clare would have definitely have had the advantage but what worried me was the way that just Limerick fell fell aside for the last 10-15 minutes you'd be hoping that it would be a bit of fatigue setting in but uh, do you know what it's no harm for Limerick it's after taking the the hype away Um, I see Clare now are the new contenders to Galway's throne so let them have it and uh, to be fair I had said it before the match that if Limerick had any ambitions of winning the All-Ireland that couldn't play in the Munster final um, I think you would have a build up of two weeks the Munster final take a lot out of the players the actual Munster final and then whether you win or lose the highs or the lows after that and then you have to face into a quarter final or a semi-final uh, of an All-Ireland and by the time you've all that done you're fairly spent so I think if Limerick have any ambitions to win it they're probably better off going through the route they will do you think that expectations got to them as well? Because this is the first time that anyone was saying, well, Limerick looked like the closest thing to Galway here. Um, I don't think so. Do you know, there's a lot of things you can listen to as a player. Um, I don't think John Kiley would have been saying that. Maybe the players might have believed a small bit of the hype, but um, I don't think so. I think when you go down to a field and what's, you're playing what's in front of you, so it's not stuff that's going through your head. Then you have a one-on-one battle with a guy. If he's beating you, you have to go and try and beat him. And I don't think what's written in the papers or in the media is going to affect you out in the pitch that much. So you would have known John Kiley because he was on the panel with you back in the in the nineties. Can you explain what sort of a character he is and what sort of a manager you've seen him be? Yeah, John. John's a steely character. He's he's quiet when you'd meet him. He'd he'd be. I'd regard him as a gentleman. Um, but whether it was on the, on the the field of play are managing like to be fair to John he, he served his apprenticeship in Limerick he was with the 21s and he was in then with the seniors for a while so he, he deserved his shot in there um, I suppose when you're going well you're a great manager with regards players um, when you call out teams which I do uh, 15 lads think you're great 11 lads think you're okay and then the remainder of the squad think you're an absolute dick. So, to be fair, um, people agree and disagree with what John has done, but have Limerick improved? Most definitely. Um, they're playing a nice brand of hurling. Um, as I said, one match doesn't make them all Ireland contenders the same way as one match doesn't write them off for the season. Who would you be playing up front? Because Shane Dowling started the other day. Like he's, uh, he started in the match against Clare. Brilliant hurler. Aaron Galan had been suspended, so you could understand why he wouldn't. Like what, what sort of inside line would you like? Because Pat Ryan had come on to some effect in games. He was left out at 26. You have Barry Nash there. You have, uh, you have a few more options as well. How would you like to see that forward line? Well, look, it is the same as I try and do with any teams I have. It's... Whoever's performing best at training and coming up to matches, and it looks like that that's the way John is is kind of running with it. It no reputation seemed to be coming into it. If 
people said Graham Mulcahy he was finished he, he first couple of matches he was outstanding mm-hmm. you know so he was obviously producing at the training um, you know so I, I would trust in John that the guys that he's putting out are the, are the best guys out there like it's very easy for me and, and the holders on the ditch to turn around and say who we think should be there but unless we are there at training every night and seeing how they're performing um, I think we have to trust in John and you would have coached some of these players under age. You were inv- you had Keane Lynch at under fourteen, under fifteen, under sixteen level. Um, you were over the Limerick Camogie team as well, so you managed Sarah Carey, and both of those would be related to to Kieran Carey. Is is it a funny situation for you now to have been managing the kind of the next generation having played with Kieran? Yeah, it's it's quite disturbing, really, because it it lets you know how old you are. Um, yeah, we had them lads. I had Sean Finn, and I would have held with his father. Um, with Barry Garrod Hegarty yeah I didn't actually coach Garrod he was, he was a bit older than the lads uh, with Sean Finn Barry Nash Mike's son with Keane you know there was there was loads of lads there that, that were coming through and that but look the way I look at it is and why I get involved in coaching and, and managing is I, I happen to play the game at the highest level the only reason that could happen was coaches at club level coaches at county level and guys that give up their time to to facilitate me playing mm. um, that's why I do it uh, I just I love the game and, but I love seeing guys progress and look from the time Keane Lynch came in at first trial at under 14s and believe me we had a tough job to get him in because he was playing soccer mm. he didn't want to come I asked him to come in I said, show us what you made the first 10 minutes with him, whipped off, we'd seen enough, and we told him to go in and enjoy his soccer. And we worked with that. Other than that, would he have come in? We don't know. Um, so you have to manage players, their skill levels, but you've also to manage everything else that's going on in their lives. And look, that's something I enjoy. We try to be as fair and upfront as we can. Um, and to be fair, when you're managing anyone's sons or daughters that I played with, Never once has one of them come to me and asked for anything. They've just left it up to me the same way I will do with my own lads. I'm not involved with the team, so I'm not going to be uh, barracking managers and things, If even if I disagree with them. It's, that, it's not the place. If someone comes up to me, I'll say, jobs available next year, you come and do it. And as, as a former goalkeeper for many years yourself, what do you think that the modern goalkeeper is very different from your time, even though it's not all that long ago? Yeah, I'd actually love it now, especially the one on ones at uh, the penalties. I was an advocate for bringing that in. Um, the game has changed hugely. Uh, it's all the short puck outs and tactics. In our day, it was your Gary Kirby and Frankie Callan, you lobbed it down as far as you could and hoped to win it. Um, but the game has changed massively the speed of the game, now the skill of the game. But the downside of that is the time that has to be put into it by players. I don't think the game is as enjoyable. As, as when we were playing, and that's only 20, 25 years ago. But why, what part of it do you think isn't as enjoyable? I don't think the longevity can be there because there's guys training five, six times a week. Um, there's a guy that used to play with a club back in, in West Limerick, Danny Boy O'Connor, beautiful holder, small guy, you know, with fabulous skill, and he said to a fellow one day, he said, back in my day, he said, we only trained once a week, but we hold every day. Mm. Do you know... No, they're still only probably holding two, three times a week. But the gym work that goes in, the running, all that. So is it enjoyable? Look at the amount of guys that are going off to America. You know, we have we've a huge problem in Kildare um, with guys going travelling. And you can't blame them. You know, it's one team wins the All-Ireland every year at the top level. Uh, everyone else is training for second, third, fourth, fifth place. You know the effort and time that goes in so look at Dublin footballers I think if you look at the programme half of them are AIG brand ambassadors there isn't too many fellas now builders block layers carpenters stuff like that it's it's becoming a game for students mm-hmm. um, that have the summers off and have time people trying to have families trying to build houses keep jobs down it's, it's getting even tougher now but I suppose history and time will tell whether the guys, when they're gone from it 20 years, will look back and say, God, I really enjoyed that. I hope they do, because 
Hulling is the best game in the world. Like there's no there's no arguing of that. So I hope they are enjoying it. And there'll be no one on this show arguing about that. One final question about goalkeepers. I noticed James Gettle's puck outs were landing more or less on the 14 against Kilkenny. Even in a club game recently, I saw a guy hit a puck out and it actually bounced wide. Do you think there's an issue with the slitters? Do you think something needs to change? I mean, in your day, I don't think you were pucking it to the 14, were you? No, um, unless you're a gale behind you. Yeah. Um, look, the slitters have changed. The game has sped up. Um, but look, games evolve. Do you know, P- Guys are stronger now. I guarantee you, James Cahill, he's a bigger man than I was. He's probably in the gym five, six nights a week. Uh, we were in the gym never. <laughs> um, you know, you got your strength from doing manual work or whatever. Um, so that is... Uh, will the slitter being heavier make the game any better? I don't know. I don't think it will. I just think the speed and the skill at the moment of the game is... I don't think it can get much faster. It's it's definitely a, um, a spectacle, and anybody from outside the country, and even you can see I see on Twitter that even the football side are coming over and uh, commenting on how good the game, the hurling is this year. Um, so if if we're looking at that, maybe they might put the football a bit lighter so that they'll travel up and down the field a bit more. So that's the thoughts of Joe Quaid. Um, we're going to look at some of the odds for the weekend now. I'm joined on the line by Leon Blanche of Boy Sports. How are you doing, Leon? Doing very well. How are you? Great, flying it, flying it. And Ger Gilroy here in the studio as well. Ger, what a time to be alive. Yeah, Newbridge or Nowhere has been absolutely brilliant fun all week. Yeah. They got, Kildare got their way, your men got their way, but are they going to make good on it now? I think the spread is right. It's four points. I think they had a bit of in Croker. You would have had to make Mayo six, seven point favourites. They beat them nine points in the qualifiers a couple of years ago. Um, but I, I do think that like Kildare are going to make a, a go of this, irrespective of the fact that there may be more Mayo fans in the crowd than Kildare fans. That doesn't matter. It's the tightness of the pitch that Kildare wanted, and it was that sense of togetherness that they needed. So I think it'll be a tight game, but I can see Mayo. You would make Mayo favours, that's fair enough. I don't think any, anybody's going to um, quibble with that. And uh, the oddsmakers have been bang on. The, the spreads and the GA have been like, it's been uh, razor sharp up to the last minutes. Yeah, even those Dublin games, games like oh, 23 games against watch. Wicklow yeah. and it was 22 on the spread. Leon, um, Mayo struggled past Tipperary for a long time they were in trouble but is it going to be like last season when there's going to be a game where they just actually take off again and they're heading straight for September? Oh, well, I don't know about heading straight for September yet but I have a funny feeling Mayo will easily cover the handicap. Easily? I think Kildare, well, I'm looking at minus three at 10 to 11. Um... I fancy that. I think Mayo minus three points, even though it's in Newbridge, great that Kildare um, kept their home tie, which it always should have been, in Newbridge. There are the rules. But Mayo are coming there. Yes, Tipperary played well in the first half, but I think Mayo's experience and their skill and and, and their forwards uh, came into their own in the second half against Tip. Um, I fancy Andy Moran to get the first goal of the game at 7-1. to one. But I do fancy Mayo minus three at 10 to 11 to knock Kildare out of the championship. I think everyone would agree Mayo were going to win. It's just about by how much. I think 11 to 2 for Kildare to win the, be winning at halftime and Mayo full time isn't bad either. We've seen so often that Mayo just struggle to get going in the first half, but they squeeze it out in the second. Not great starters. Kildare led against Longford in the 71st minute, I think, for the first half, or maybe the 69th minute of that game. So <laughs> You're just going to beat me down straight away. Well, it could be, it could be a nil-all draw at halftime. Wouldn't be surprised. Mm. Daniel Flynn, 11-5 to to get a goal at any stage. I can see him taking on that Mayo defence. I don't think they're going to be ultra-defensive Mayo. No, so it's, I think this could be a high-scoring game. Like, mm. irrespective of the whole stuff about it being a tight pitch, you can definitely see the fact that it's a tight pitch, like, both sides have point takers who can kick the ball over from quite far out. And look, we've, we've seen both sides actually have um, that history of kicking bad wides. So, if they have their shooting boots on, you can see the total points of 36 and a half being covered. But if it's one of those days where they're both, the radar is a little bit off because, um, you know, it is a tight pitch, then who knows. And is Keane O'Neill the new Messiah, you being a Kildare man? Look, I, I said a couple of weeks back that irrespective of the difficulties they'd had, they should time down for a couple of years and commit to him because they need a sense of we're here together, collectively, in it for the long haul. Like, if you have doubts about your manager, you either make the change quickly or you decide to, to double down. Like, you, you see what they did in Kerry, they gave Infants Morris a three-year deal when it's clear they have a, a natural successor waiting in the wings who's brought through all that underage talent, who's won in All-Ireland, Jack O'Connor. But, like, Kildare needs somebody to pin their 
uh, hat on and say, okay, I am the manager and I'm going to take whatever difficulty and learnings we've had from the terrible season and we're going to get better next year as opposed to, well, that didn't work, let's get the new guy in. Mm, this could be the making of him. Uh, Leon, Cavan against Tyrone as well. Tyrone are playing for a fifth weekend in a row. Do you think like they had a handy enough win over Kildare? Sorry, over Carlo. Um, do you fancy Tyrone here? I do fancy them. Um, you are right in saying that they're, they're playing their fifth week in a row, but I thought last week's victory was facile. It was, surely wouldn't have taken too much out of them. But Cavan will be tough, and they'll put it right up to them. Yes, it's in it's in a neutral ground, but I think this is a lot better for Cavan not being in Crow Park. I thought if it had been in Crow Park, I thought Tyrone would have definitely utilised the big spaces of Croker, and I thought that could have been a bit of a hiding for Cavan. I think... Cavan will keep it very tight, as tight as they possibly can. Make it physical, make it tough for Tyrone. A couple of hard challenges in the first five to ten minutes. That's what I'd like to see from Cavan. Ruffle up Tyrone if you can. Um, but I think Tyrone will get through. Um, I think they'll make it on to the final round of the qualifiers. It's amazing when you think about it. In history, Cavan are the kingpins of Ulster. I think there was a period at one stage, maybe 50 or 60 years ago, they won 14 out of 15 Ulster titles. They were the Dublin then, um, back in Ulster. Can you see a way for them to win this game? No, not at all. No? I think that um, I think that Tyrone, in the last 10, 15 minutes, the Carlo game, kind of found that self-expression. And I think, you know, it's interesting how... Oh, three weeks in a row is a disaster for the hurlers and here's Tyrone actually beginning to find form and find a bit of style of play five weeks out of six. Um, I think that they're actually going to cover the spread here. It's five points. It's a big spread for Ulster football but by all accounts, Cavan were, it was a complete fluke that they managed to get out of the down game and I don't know, I, I just can't see uh, Cavan rectifying their season against Tyrone's weekend. Yeah, uh, and I, re- I read a piece from a guy in the anglo uh, I think it was Poffitt's Patrick, and he was saying that at times they were playing three sweepers against Down as well, who wouldn't That's be... That's the Black Death, yeah, right there. They're not exactly shooting the lights out. I think Cavan traditionally would be more of a, a free-scoring type team. They haven't beaten Tyrone in 35 years, so... Not going to happen this week. Yeah, it's very hard to see that happening. Um, two of the other football games... Are Armagh Clare and Leitrim against Monaghan. They've never played each other before as well, so there's an element of the unknown here. I, I think um, Collins had a point when he said it's ridiculous that uh, Division 3 teams have to travel to Division 2 teams. Yes. Like, when Armagh got promoted, they're going to be in the same division next year. There yeah. should be a two-tier, two-division rule. Division 1 versus 3 or 4, Division 2 versus Division 4. But if it's Division 2 and 3, like, is there really that much difference between the teams in Division 2 and Division 3 at the moment? There aren't. Not so, enough. So, at that point... CCCC should step in and say, okay, the rules for this are if it's one uh, and oh, you're so in now you want the CCCC to step in. Oh, well, earlier in the week you didn't want them to step in. <laughs> well, you know. well, a bit convenient, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Leon, how do you think Leitrim Monaghan's going to go? I think there's only um, one way. Well, yeah, Monaghan all the way and I think Armagh all the way against Clare. I think Armagh at 8-13, to 13, look, you're not going to get rich backing them, but I fully expect Armagh to see off Clare. Yeah, the 11-point handicap for Monaghan, do you think they'll cover it? Um, it's a big, big handicap, isn't it? But yeah. it all depends on the Monaghan players. If they're seven, eight, nine points up, do they really want to keep kicking on, kicking on, kicking on, knowing that they have another game next week? I, I'm not so sure. 11 points is a big, big head start for Leitrim. Um, I'd be tending to go with the plus instead of the minus 11 there. I think Jack McCarron at 10-1, to 1, he's not bad for first goal scorer either. I'd imagine I could see him starting. We, we don't know the teams as things stand and maybe someone like Conor McCarthy might shoot the lights out as well. Armagh, um, Claire, do you think season, I think season four maybe, or is it season five for, for Kieran McGinney at this stage? He previously managed your county. Do you think it's... They have to win. They've got to, get, they've got to give themselves a shot at getting into the Super 8s. Like, like, I don't think that too many teams in the Super 8s would be worried about playing Armagh and yet that run of games that they've had would give them an opportunity to springboard through. Equally, like, you know, everybody knows that from this round, really, Roscommon are the only ones you don't want because they have a team who have quality and a bit of confidence. But everybody else, if Armagh were to win this and get Cork in the next game, they'd be happy enough with that, right? Yeah, I think so as well. So then moving on to the, the two provincial finals in Hurling as well. Galway Kilkenny, first of all, Leon, what way do you see that, uh, what way do you see that going? Well, I think the first thing I have to say for this game is the new and exclusive offer for offtheball.com uh, forward slash spoil sports. I think we're going crazy with Galway. I think we're pushing them out. To f- I, I think it's 5-1 to one Galway just to win for new account holders. Now, I really, really fancy Galway. Um, I think they've just grown in stature 
winning last year's All Ireland has been pretty much the making of them. It's amazing what winning one can do for your confidence and self belief. Now they're going out every single week whenever they play, and they're not afraid of any team. And um, the way they dismantled Kilkenny in um, earlier on, like in the format, it was men against boys. And I just think this big pitch for Galway will definitely suit them. They can score from anywhere on the park. Canning is playing unbelievably well. He can score from inside his own half, let alone if he gets inside the danger area. It's no surprise Galway are favourites at 4-11. to 11. Kilkenny are 11-4. to 4. So that goes to show you how much of a nice offer that is for anyone who's tuning in to the Hurling Show on OffTheBall.com. Back Galway if you don't have an account with Boyle Sports already. But I think Galway will win. And I actually fancy the minus four. I think Galway will really put down a marker here on Sunday against Kilkenny. I don't see Kilkenny troubling Galway. I think Galway will be relishing this match. Yes, people will say Cody will have the Cats revved up. I've no doubt he will. But I just think you've got to look at the two teams at the moment. And Galway, to me, possesses an awful lot more in the first 15 and also on the bench. So for me, it's Galway all the way. Galway pretty much dismantled teams. It was Galway in third gear against Dublin and they struggled over the line. But the way they dismissed Wexford, like at no stage did Wexford look like winning that game. At no stage did Kilkenny. They got three scores from play. Surely it's got to be Galway half-time, full-time, even if you fancy that. That's, that's, that's four to six. Whereas if you want to go Galway minus four, that's ten to eleven. Is there, uh, is there a slight fear that Kilkenny in that first half were decent? Like that was as good as Kilkenny got over the course of the game? And that Kilkenny might have the street smarts to live with the team for 40, 45 minutes. Like, I, I, I actually think the better the weekend is going minus four, to be honest. I think yeah. that's the that's where my chips are going this weekend. Um, Colin Fenley and Richie Power are going to be on the bench. Uh, Richie Hogan going to be on the bench for this. It's like, I know the team hasn't been named yet, but yeah. we might have had a sneak peek at it. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, even if they are playing, have they played enough hurling to be tr- really, really effective? I think Colin Fenley has contributed somewhat. Uh, Richie Hogan... You wouldn't expect him to be at his at his usual amazing self just yet. So it's very hard to expect them to come in and turn it around. And some of the young guys who were performing really well earlier in the year, we we saw how they dismantled Tip in the league final. It just hasn't. They haven't looked as good in uh, summer hurling on the firm ground. So I'd I'd struggle to see. I can see Connor Whelan going in full forward. I think Porrick Walsh might well move out of full back. He did quite well when he came out to the half back line against Wexford when they came from nine behind, which can't be discounted either. To come from nine behind against Wexford to win, no. that was huge. But Connor Whelan, eight to one for the first goal. That's good. That's not bad either. That inside forward line is devastating at the moment. Like, so they actually they have strength in every line in the field. I, I think the point that Leon made about um, them seeing a dividend from being All Ireland champions. I can't remember as pronounced a dividend. I can't remember a team accepting the role and mantle of favouritism and we deserve to be here and we're the flat track bullies now. Like Kilkenny were the last team who kind of were released somehow into being All Ireland champions. And like, so apart from the greatest Kilkenny the team, which was obviously the greatest team of all time, the last team to go back to back was Cork. And that's the way back at the start of the last decade when they had Sean Og and that amazing team. So like, that's the level of, of team I think that we have at the moment. And I can see them blitzing their way through the rest of the championship. With the, I want to see the Limerick game. I want to, whatever happens, I want to see Limerick. Them, yeah, that's, yeah. The, that's the clash of styles that I'm most interested in over the course of the rest of the hurling season. But I think that that's the better of the weekend. Because mm, styles make fights. Uh, we'll go to the Munster final as well. I think we're all agreed that Galway are going to win the Leinster final. But the Munster final, Galway against Clare. Now, I'm always hammering Clare. As you know, we've done it off the ball many times and I've hammered Clare because what have you done for me lately? What did you even do before the All-Ireland? But to be fair to Clare, if they win this Munster final, they'll have beaten every single team in the competition to do it. And no team has obviously ever done that before because of the way the structure has been previously. Um, Leon, how do you see this game going? I see it being very, very tight, lads. Um, I don't think there's going to be a puck of a ball between these two teams. Um, I think Cork and Clare are extremely evenly matched. The betting will suggest that. It's even money Cork, 11 to 10 Clare. But I'm going to happily take the 8 to 1 about the draw. I just find it very, very difficult to try and call a winner here. Um, I'm really looking forward to watching this game. I think it's going to be one hell of a game of hurling. Um there's points to prove for both counties. Um, Clare, I think, really want to win a Munster Championship. As you rightly said, they haven't done much since winning the All-Ireland. What was that, back in 2013? It was, yeah. So they're going to have to really step up to the plate now, win a Munster Championship and kick on. But Cork will also have a marker to lay down. Um, 
they obviously changed their management last summer. Coming in with a new management team, they'll want to win a Munster Championship. So there's an awful lot at stake here on Sunday. And that's why I find it too hard to call. I'd happily take the 8-1 to one about the draw and look forward to witnessing a very, very good game of hurling. Plenty of skill, plenty of hits. But I just think trying to pick a winner at even money or 11-10, to 10, it's very, very difficult to do so. Draw at half time and draw at full time is sixty six to one. Would you have a nibble on that? Yeah, I mean that, that's the type of thing that's going to keep you interested in this game, um, like uh, from a financial perspective. But I do think the, the main point here is just enjoy this game as two sides who are unbelievably evenly matched. One side owes the other a little bit for what happened earlier on in the season. Can you beat the same team twice? Like you know, it's impossible to. You can make a case with all the stats and all the previews for either team and it could be almost the same case that you use against that team to show how or why they're going to lose this match so like this should be one of those matches you just anticipate and watch and enjoy the uh, the Galway beating Kilkenny by more than 4 points Seamus Harnady 8-1 to one for first goal John Conlon who's up there for hurler of the year at the moment 15-2 to two as well so they're not bad odds either for first goal scorer I'm, like, you definitely would expect Cork to be the first team to score a goal yeah. just the way that these games have gone Mm. Harnley is a better bet I think than Colin but Colin scores a hat-trick in the first 15 minutes don't come looking for me <laughs> <laughs> alright lads uh, we'll leave it there so thanks very much to you Leon all the best lads have a great weekend and yourself too as well so uh, we're going to have reporters all around the grounds at the weekend at Armagh Clare we're going to have Neil Tracy at Cavan Throne we'll have Dave McIntyre Kildare Mayo we'll have Maura Trasa and Kjallig and then on Sunday at Cork Clare we'll have Jamesy and Jamesy O'Connor and Dave McIntyre Galba Kilkenny will have Tommy Walsh and Maura Trasa and Kjallig again so uh, that's it for the Hurland Show you can get us on Twitter off the ball YouTube podcasts any way you want it we'll see you again next week